Welcome to Geography 485 585L, Module 2.1, Introduction to HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. In this lecture, we will be covering the basics of web development, starting with the parts of a web page, then moving into a little bit more detailed discussion of the structure, presentation, and behavior components of website development that are defined through the use of the hypertext markup language or HTML or the XML alternative called XHTML. Styling using the cascading style sheets language and adding behavior and interaction to web pages using the JavaScript language. We will then review some simple web pages and then introduce a more complete web page example that we will cover in more detail as a part of the class section in the middle of the week. Web development, in addition to the documents that you're going to produce, also requires the availability of a web server or a computer system that is running specialized software that, allow, that is listening for incoming requests from computers out on the internet. The web server software must have access to the file locations on that server where the files that you've created, including any HTML, CSS, or JavaScript files, um, are stored. To be able to be used by the web server, those files must be readable by all users on the system. That means that depending upon the operating system that is hosting the web server, the file permissions in that operating system need to, need to be set so that the files are readable by all users. The GitHub platform that we are using for hosting the web content for this class takes care of that by providing the gh-pages branch within your GitHub repository that already has those permissions set and is providing the web server for you. The general process for creating a website starts with the creation of content using the HTML or XHTML language, where in either case, you're essentially defining the content and the structure of that content. Once you have the basic content and structure in place, you can then customize the appearance of that content through the definition of styles using the cascading style sheet or CSS language. Furthermore, you can add interactivity and essentially dynamic behaviors to your website through the use of the JavaScript language. As you go through the development process of your website, you're typically going to repeat this loop over and over again as you add additional content, style that content, and update and modify the behaviors and interactions of the website that you're developing. So as we start talking about the parts of a web page, we need to talk about the structural elements that define essentially the blocks of content that constitute a web page. In this display, we see that there are pairs of tags that define blocks of content. With the outermost pair of tags, in this case, being the HTML block, starting at line one and finishing on line 22 in the displayed example. You can recognize the pairs of tags by the opening tag having the opening and closing brackets and then the name of the element between those brackets. So we can see here that the opening HTML tag has an opening bracket, the letters HTML, and then a closing bracket. The corresponding closing tag for that HTML block is on line 22, where the tag is the same except for the slash that is inserted between the opening bracket and the name of the element, in this case, HTML. In just about all the instances that you're working in in HTML, you're going to be looking for paired tags like these to mark the beginning and end of content that is contained within those tags and contained within the element bounded by those tags. In all web pages, you're going to have a containing HTML block. 
And then inside that HTML block, you're going to have two primary areas. The head area, as you can see here, starting on line three and ending on line eight, with the head tag opening the block on line three and the slash head tag closing the block on line eight. Within the head of your web page, you're typically going to have information about the document as a whole. In this case, we have an example of a title tag that defines the title of the page. This is information that may often be displayed either in the tab or the window that is displaying the web page. This is also where you can put other information about the page in meta tags, which we'll see examples of in a few minutes. Also, this is a, uh, an area where you will often define styles or blocks of JavaScript or provide links to external JavaScript or style files that you've created. The body element is where you put all of your content. And this is where you can use any number of tags that define the structure and content of your web page. And we just see a number of examples here in terms of different types of headers, blocks of content uh, delineated by div elements, paragraphs of text by the P elements, tables that are uh, providing access or displaying tabular information, images or forms that you would like users to interact with in terms of providing information, and a variety of lists. These are only some samples of the wide variety of HTML elements that you can put into the body of your web page to provide that combination of structure and content that determines what is going to be displayed as a part of the page. As we dig a little deeper into the structure of a web page, we can start talking in a little bit more detail about the HTML and XHTML um, content and tagging system. So as we saw examples of in the previous slide, some sample uh, tags that you can use in either HTML or XHTML include paragraphs or blocks of text that are contained within that pair of P tags, where the opening tag is bracket P closing bracket, and the end of a paragraph is marked by a slash P. You can also define headings. Headings are very useful for defining the hierarchical structure of your content. And this is where you must resist the temptation to use header tags to define styles because every browser will display header tags and header content using some default styles. But again, you should re resist the temptation to use the header tags to achieve a particular default style. Instead, use them only for defining that hierarchical organizational structure of your content as that organizational structure defined by the header tags is used by a number of clients to help structure and present the information that you're providing. Header tags are hierarchical in that they're numbered sequentially. So the highest level of order of your ordering or hierarchy is the H1 tag. Below that you have H2, 3, 4, and so on. So as you're designing your, your content, you can think of it in terms of an outline where your headings are essentially your headings that you would think about in terms of an outline structure. If you need to present tabular information, you can use the table tags to define the block of content that should constitute that table. There are other elements that then go inside that table block to define the columns and rows the headers and other content that is going into a table. Historically, tables had been used to actually define the layout of pages. That is generally not done anymore and not recommended. Instead, we use other um, block content tags called divs in some instances to define blocks of content that we want to then position or style according to our sort of layout designs on the page. And we'll talk about the div tags again in just a minute. You can also define a variety of lists, list types. There are two primary blocks of of lists that you can define. Ordered lists defined by the OL and closing OL tags. 
and unordered lists defined by the UL and closing UL tags. Typically, the default behavior is for ordered lists to either be numbered or lettered, while unordered lists will typically be bulleted, where you can control how those are marked using cascading style sheet definitions for those lists. If you're needing to capture information from users, you can often use a form block and a set of HTML form elements to capture different types of information from your users. And you would contain those inside this, the opening and closing tag for a form. Finally, we have the div tags that I mentioned earlier as being essentially an arbitrary tool for being able to define blocks of content that you somehow want to treat as a unit. So it could be that you want to style those blocks by positioning them in a particular area. Say you have a navigation area or you have a sidebar that you want to put content into. You can define a div to contain that content and then use style sheets or JavaScript to control what is going into that div or how that div is going to be displayed. Ultimately, all of this structural information that you're defining through the use of HTML or XHTML tags is translated into something called the Document Object Model or DOM by the web browser or other client that is reading the document that is being delivered by the web server. It's this Document Object Model that is later used by Cascading Style Sheets and JavaScript to identify what parts of the document should be modified in terms of how they should be presented or what DOM objects should have behaviors either attached to them or should be modified in some way through the use of JavaScript. Moving on, once we have created our structure, we can then work on how we want to present that structure through the application of styles defined using cascading style sheets or CSS. Styles can be defined in three different, think of it as locations, within your website. The first and often preferred method for defining styles is through an external file that you then link to in the head block of your web page. This gives you the advantage of having one master style or set of styles that can be reused by multiple web pages. So you can control the look of your entire website through the reference to this one style sheet or style document. If you change that style sheet, then those changes are reflected in all of the pages that are using that style sheet. That's in contrast to Another method for essentially linking styles to objects in your web page, and that's by defining styles in the head area itself for each page. There is very little difference if all you have is a one page website between having an external style sheet and styles that are defined within that single page. But as soon as you have multiple pages, you'll probably want to use that external style sheet. Many of the examples that I'm providing as a part of this class actually use this second approach though, where we define the styles in the head block of a web page. This is a common practice for providing in a single HTML document, both the structure and the styles associated with that structure for explanation purposes. Also, if a particular page needs additional styling beyond the styling that is applied to the entire website, you can define that in the head block of the web page. Finally, you can actually embed styles directly into the elements themselves that you are defining in the body of your web page. So you can actually set up a style for a specific paragraph in your document as a part of the opening tag for that element. This is not something you generally want to do. You will see examples of this uh, primarily in documents that have been generated by applications like Microsoft Word or other programs that are converting, say, 
word processing documents to web pages. But generally, this is a very difficult um, style of or model for styling to maintain and update as you have to look in every single element in your document and override or change the element styles one by one. It's a very labor intensive and unpleasant task to try to update your styles if you've used this embedded model. So I strongly recommend against that um, as you're working on developing your websites. For styles that are not embedded within an element itself, essentially through reference to an external style sheet or styles that are defined in the head, air, head block of your web page, you can um, define those styles and link them to particular elements through this combination of a selector, basically something that is going to indicate what elements a style should be applied to, and then the definition of the style itself, which is one or more style definitions enclosed in curly brackets, where if there are multiple style definitions, they're separated from each other by semicolons. So in the example here, we are selecting all H1 elements, that's the selector, and then we have two styles that are going to be applied to those. We're going to define the text color as red. That's the color colon red style. We then have a semicolon following that as we're defining a second style where we're defining the font size for those H1 elements as being 18 pixels high. So again, in this example, we have a selector and a style. If we think about selectors, there are a variety of selectors you can use to link styles to specific elements in your web page. The first one we've already seen an example of where you can essentially specify an element name, whether it's a heading level, a P tag for paragraphs, a table, a list, or any other element that's a part of your HTML document. So here we see the same example that we saw up above where we have an H1 element, and then we have defined as a style, an H1 selector, and a style for red text of 18 pixels in height. You can also have very granular control in the definition of your styles through the use of identifiers or IDs, where you can assign a unique ID to any element in your web page. And then you can use that ID as a selector. So you can see here we have a paragraph that has an additional attribute in the opening tag where ID equals para01 in quotes. You can see then on the next line the selector that we're using to key in on that specific paragraph is the hash mark followed by the ID para01. There's no space between those. So in this instance, we're really going to apply this style to only the element, this paragraph, that has an idea, ID of para01. And we're going to apply a style that's going to be blue text of a font size of 12 pixels. If we want to apply a style to more than one element, we can use a class definition. So in the example here, we've created two paragraph elements, each one of which has a class attribute where that class equals instructions in quotes. So if we want to apply a style to that class of elements, we can then use the selector dot class name, where in this case it's dot instructions with no space. And then we have a, a style that we're defining that's going to apply, be applied to all elements that are assigned to that class. So this color red, font size 12 pixels, text decoration blink is going to be applied to all paragraphs that have a class equals instructions attribute as a part of their opening tag. These are just some simple illustrations of how selectors and styles are developed. The readings you have and the online resources we 
are uh, using have some much more detailed uh, citations of different selectors and combinations of selectors that can be used to create the linkage between the structure that you've created and the styles that you want to use to modify how that structure is displayed to the user. Finally, we can talk about behavior, where behavior is essentially interactivity that is linked to a particular web page, where there are a number of languages that can be used to provide interactivity on web pages, but the most interoperable language, the language that is most broadly supported by the most browsers and operating systems is JavaScript. And that's the language that we're going to be focusing on in this class. In particular, it's important to remember that JavaScript is a full-fledged programming language. Um, so it's, it, there is a learning curve for learning to work in JavaScript, and it takes some time to become proficient in it. That having been said, we're only going to skim across the surface of using JavaScript with a particular focus on the internet mapping uh, frameworks and APIs for, that are using JavaScript. But hopefully this will give you enough of an introduction to be able to then explore JavaScript more on your own and experiment with additional types of interactivity that you might want to use in your own web pages. If you have any experience with other programming languages, then you should be able to learn JavaScript more easily as the core concepts behind multiple programming languages are very similar to each other. The bottom line is that you can use JavaScript to define the actions that may, are going to be taken within a web page, either on or by elements in the document object model, where again, that document object model is defined by the structure of the content that you've created on that page. So it could be that you are going to, through your JavaScript, modify existing DOM elements you may actually create new DOM elements, or you may um, essentially uh, uh, trigger actions through the user interacting with given DOM elements. In all cases, essentially what you're doing is linking behaviors to structure that you've created in your web page or structure that you have modified using JavaScript. Ultimately, this translates into a technology that allows you to create interactive web pages that can often behave much like a local desktop application, which is an increasingly important expectation that users have when working with websites. Here are a number of links for some resources that you might find useful, whether it's for HTML or JavaScript or cascading style sheets. Um, W3C Schools and WebMonkey.com both provide a variety of references and cheat sheets um, where the documents coming out of the World Wide Web Consortium relate more to the definition of the standards and how they operate um, and providing some additional uh, resources for learning how to work with these standards that have been developed by the World Wide Web Consortium or W3C. Now let's look at a simple web page. Harking back to the structure that we were discussing earlier, you can see that this web page has that basic structure that we were talking about earlier with the addition of this, this doc type element at the very top of the web page. This is something that is required to essentially tell the web browser what variation of HTML or XHTML the web page is using. This is something you're going to see on pretty much every web page you encounter, and it will be required on all the web pages that you develop. So in this case, this doc type element is telling the web browser that this is an XHTML um, page and that it should interpret and render the content appropriately. You can then see that we have the opening and closing HTML block starting on line four and finishing on line 14. We have our head block starting on line five and finishing on line eight that contains two elements, 
a meta element that is defining some information about this web page. In this case, it's the content type and the character set of this page. Again, this is another piece of information that the browser can use to help display the information on the web page properly. And it's also defining the title of the page that some clients will use to, again, add some descriptive information either to a tab in the tabbed browser or to the top of a window in, in that web browser. We then have the body that starts on line 9 and goes through line 13 that contains three elements, a level 1 header and two paragraphs. In all three instances, those are unmodified or otherwise um, very simple um, elements that have been used to define the structure of this, of this web page. If we click on the link to the example, you can see that this is the default way in which Chrome, the browser that I'm working in here, displays this content in the absence of any styles or other modifications to the information. If you're on any web page, you can often in your browser look at what the underlying source code is. So in Chrome, if I right click and choose view page source, I can actually see the source code that is used to define the structure and content of this web page. That's an incredibly useful trick for learning from other websites, other web developers, the strategies they use to structure and create their content. So if you're ever curious about how a web developer has designed their page, you can always look at the source code and see how they did it. We can take that simple web page and now add some styling to it to modify that default display to something that is what we would prefer the, the browser use instead of those defaults. So in this case, we now have a new element in the head of this document, starting at line 8 and ending at line 12, that is a block that is defining a set of styles that we want to use on this page. And you can see that we have three styles. One that defines a style for all H1 elements. The second style defining uh, the way we want to display all paragraphs that have been assigned to the para class. That's what that p.para selector means. Finally, we have a selector that is going to look for a specific element with the ID of annoying. And we're going to apply this style only to that element that has that ID of annoying. We can now see in the body, I have modified two of the paragraph elements where I have added the first paragraph element to the class para with the class equals para um, attribute being added to the element. And the second paragraph has both been added to the para class and has been assigned the ID of annoying, meaning that I want to uh, basically apply two styles to that paragraph, the style that is linked to that para class and the style that is linked to that annoying ID. One concept with styles is this idea of cascading style sheets where browsers implementing CSS will typically override more specific styles when they are provided. So in this case, any styles that are linked to that ID are going to override styles that are linked to that class para. And that's something you're going to learn through experimentation, but that's the cascading part of cascading style sheets. So if we look at this styled page, you can see that those default uh, styles are no longer being used, and instead those styles that we defined are, are, are controlling the way the page is displayed instead. Here we have a page that is very similar to the simple web page we've been working with so far. But in this case, we now have a script block that has been added into the head area, starting on line 8 and going through line 13, where within that script block, we have defined a single function 
called Generic Alert. You're going to see more about functions and JavaScript in the coming weeks. But in this instance, we can just think of Generic Alert as a block of code that we have named so that we can refer to it by name when we want to execute it at some time in the future. Inside that block of code, we essentially have two JavaScript commands. The first one on line 10 is going to generate a simple alert. So this is basically asking the browser to show an alert to the user. The second command is actually applying a style to a particular element where the element that it's going to apply the style to is one that has an ID of click me. So let's keep that in mind as we then look down into the body and we can see that on line 19, we've added a third paragraph where that paragraph has an ID of click me. So you might remember that we have a, a command in that JavaScript function that's going to change the style of an element that has the click me ID. So you can expect that this paragraph may change in some way when that function is executed. And then we can also see that as a part of the opening tag for that paragraph, we now have an on click event capture command that basically says if somebody clicks on this paragraph, on this element, execute this JavaScript function or this JavaScript code. So this is going to be the trigger to have the JavaScript function generic alert execute. So let's see what this looks like in our example. Here's our web page. You might have noticed that we don't have any styles attached to this. So we're looking at a generic display of this content again. But you'll remember that we actually have now added this on click event and we've created a function that we have linked to this third paragraph. So if I click on this third paragraph, you can see this alert. So we know, as we know that one of the two commands in that generic um, uh, JavaScript function was to fire off an alert. And we can see that the text of that paragraph changed red. That was the second part of that JavaScript command to change the style of that existing paragraph with that ID to red. So here you've seen an example of displaying an alert and changing the style of an existing element in the document object model or DOM based on a very simple JavaScript function. Finally, we have here a more complete actual web page that is a mapper that has been developed for the display of and providing access to um, documents that are relating to um, Native American water rights settlements. And the entire web interface is defined through a combination of only 39 lines of HTML defining the structure of this page about 136 lines of styling, defining how that page should be rendered, and then about five, a little over 500 lines of JavaScript providing the interactivity for, the, for this page, in addition to additional JavaScript libraries provided by Google for the Google Maps application programming interface that we will start working with and the jQuery JavaScript framework that provides some additional functionality and tools for making it easier to develop interactive web applications. It boils down to, with actually a fairly small amount of code, you can create a very interactive um, application or web interface through the use of this combination of structure, presentation, and behavior that you write, and then existing JavaScript frameworks that are developed by others. And we'll spend some time during class later this week going through uh, this example a little bit in a little bit more detail so you can see how an actual fully functioning inter interactive mapping website can operate.